Welcome to Discovering You, a podcast that explores the intricacies of personality and how it impacts the way we navigate through life. What will you discover today? Hi, listeners. Hi, Heather. Hi there. How are you feeling? Uh, My mood meter score says I'm feeling challenged, feeling pushed to reach a higher goal. Uh, What color is that? What zone is that in? Is that yellow? It's yellow. High energy and pleasant. When I thought challenged, which is why I didn't pick it other days, I think I thought it meant like I'm struggling, but really it means feeling pushed to reach a higher goal. Okay, so that is good. I think I actually had that last time or maybe it was the time before. Isn't it funny how these words, they're not what you would originally think they are. That's exactly it. Because I didn't want to pick challenged because I'm not struggling. And I thought challenged meant struggling. And I'm not struggling, but I am trying to tweak some things that will be next level stuff. And so that's kind of why I picked it. Okay, well, that makes sense. So I got, I actually had a hard time finding the word. I was hoping there would be frazzled as a word. The closest I could find is hyper, which is red. I'm very rarely in the red zone. Oh, wow. I know. But so again, you think with red, you're like, oh, sometimes you think that's going to be intense, maybe negative energy. But the description of hyper is feeling energetic and like you want to move around. That's kind of true. I'm this mix. The reason I say frazzled is I'm a mix of being (laughs) really tired because I stayed up late working last night. And then I couldn't wind down and then I had a really hard time going to sleep, but I have a lot of stuff to do and get off my plate. So I think that's the mix that I'm finding. And yeah, I really should know better that I can't, (laughs) I can't work. I know I always tell you I'm a night owl and I am because I enjoy being up at night, but usually it's like reading, relaxing, those kinds of things. If I'm actually full on capacity working, this is tying into the whole HSP part. It takes me time to really to wind down. And then even more silly. So it's about 1145. I'm still, I'm finishing working. And then I'm like, oh my gosh, I haven't done Wordle and Connections yet. (laughs) So I don't know if you do those. If listeners, if you're fans of this, you maybe (laughs) will get my struggle. I'm like, oh no. Especially with Wordle, because I'm on a streak. The other ones, it doesn't Mm -hmm. matter. But I'm like, I cannot break it. Then I ridiculously try to power through those to get those in before midnight. Not exactly conducive to a restful night. Well, and I was going to say, you didn't have a second coffee, did you? Today? No, last night. Last night. No. I kept you up? No, I didn't. But I did today because (laughs) I need it. (laughs) I'm curious why hyper would be unpleasant. Oh, just because a lot of the, sometimes the ones in the red zone are kind of angry, irritated. A lot of the words are those. So I wasn't even looking in there. And then I'm like, well, I'm not finding what I'm looking for. Interesting. Our regular listeners, for sure, you know what we're talking about. If you are new to the podcast with this episode, you can check out your own mood meter on the How We Feel app. It's obviously fun. We always have fun discussions (laughs) about it, but it will really help ground you and help you understand maybe what energy you're bringing into your day. It can be a game changer. Today, I'm going to be looking at how to recruit and hire with the help of DISC. But first, it's World Art Day. To illustrate, pun intended, (laughs) this theme, here is DISC as art. High D is cubism. This is described as revolutionary and rebellious. And Picasso is an example. I is post-impressionism. Colorful, emotive. There's a focus on the artist's feelings towards the subject. Van Gogh's Starry Night really expresses this. High S is Impressionism, depicting nature and tranquility. Think of Monet's water lilies. And High C is Precisionism, using precise, sharply defined geometrical forms. Georgia O'Keeffe's early work of cityscapes embodies this. Okay, let's get into our topic. I spent a lot of time on this podcast talking about DISC and other tools from a more theoretical perspective, but today I'm going to get into the very practical applications of using DISC as a recruiting, hiring, onboarding tool. I'm giving a talk about this in a couple of weeks, and the subject was specifically requested because people are struggling with the process of finding and hiring candidates that are suited to the position, and that will be a good fit for the company. It's been observed that churn and turnover have really increased. In the haste to hire for a role, people can make spontaneous or emotional decisions rather than applying a practical, objective process. 
you know, maybe they had a good chat with the candidate or it's a friend of a friend, but that doesn't mean that this person is going to be a good fit for the role. Before I go further, though, I do have a caveat. There are what I would call ideal disc profiles that are suited to specific roles. You've heard me say on here that high I's and high D's are a very natural fit for sales. But I want to make clear, I would never say someone can't do the job solely based on their profile. Will it come as naturally to them, though? No. Will they need a different approach? Yes. This is where the performance management piece of DISC comes in. Knowing the right way to communicate to motivate and manage that profile is a tremendous asset. Also, you have the benefit of knowing in advance that the process is going to look different. For example, managers can get restless and concerned with high S, high C profiles because they ask a lot of questions, they take notes, they take time to understand the ins and outs. That can be frustrating. But when they know it, they know it. And they'll take ownership of that without circling back with those same questions. On the other hand, high I's and D's tend to hit the ground running, but they may make mistakes. And down the road, they may still need to be reminded of the same things. Expanding on this, often it's not that the person can't do the job, but will they tire of it? Will they get bored, start making mistakes? And then they leave because of that. Here's where the churn and turnover I mentioned come in, and then you have to invest time and money to go through the process all over again. That's a merry-go-round ride that you want to avoid. Recruiting and hiring strategically begins with a detailed job description. If you don't know what the job entails, how can you hire accordingly? Great, that's nothing novel. But did you know that you can create a customized DISC profile to match the job description? In other words, you can see what the competencies you are calling for look like mapped out as a DISC profile. Then, when your candidate has completed their DISC, you can see how close of a match it is. There's a five-star rating system which allows you to see how closely the person's profile matches the job profile. It's rare to get a five-star match, but it certainly happens. Also, and this ties into the caveat from earlier, I've worked with clients who went ahead and hired someone who was only a two-star match for the role. They knew the candidate had many of the skills they were looking for, and they didn't want to pass up on them. What they did is they tweaked some of the responsibilities to give the person more of what they were strong in and reallocated some of the other tasks to someone whose profile supported those better. You can see how advantageous this is, and now you have the ability to operate tactically. Another great thing about having a job profile is that it keeps unrealistic job descriptions in check. It's very common for an advertisement to list every single skill and attribute under the sun, moon, and stars. But how likely is it to find someone with absolutely everything? Not very. When you break down a pie-in-the-sky job description into disc factors, you realize that essentially it's calling for every single disc profile combined into one. Of course, that's not possible. When you can delineate the want with an associated skill, you'll see that you can't have everything. So as an example, people who are hiring assistants, specifically in administration, will say that they have to be detail-oriented, careful, precise, and work to high standards. That makes sense, right? But they will also say they have to be a self-starter, be flexible, decisive, and not take too long to do things. When you map this out according to competencies and disc factors, you'll see that it's almost impossible to have this combination. I'll often pose the question, if you have to make a choice between speed and accuracy, which one would you choose? Heather looks like she's cracking up here. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) No, it's okay. It's resonating, right, Heather? Yeah. Again, I'm asking them, make the choice between speed and accuracy. Which one do they choose? Well, the first answer usually is, but I want both. I push back and I say, it's extremely rare to be equally strong in both. Now choose. Once that happens and the choice is made, we are way further ahead in determining what is needed to be successful in the role. I'm going to show you how this works by reading some sample questions that are used in creating a DISC job profile. Typically, we have 24, just like a DISC assessment, but we'll just do 10 to demonstrate how the required factors are searched out. 
The questionnaire uses a Likert style scale and you rank the statements from very low to very high, depending on the importance you think that requirement has to the job at hand. Now, the key consideration here is how much time the person will need to spend on the activity that's mentioned in each statement. If you believe it will comprise between 50 to 75% of their day, you're gonna answer high. If it's even more than that, like over 75%, you would answer very high. And of course, the flip side, if it's less than 50% or 25%, you're gonna select low and very low, respectively. Now, to make this more tangible, let's use the administrative role that I mentioned as the sample job we're creating a profile for. Heather, do you wanna do this together? For sure. Let's do it. All right. The first statement on the job profile questionnaire is, number one, must concentrate on detail easily. We are going to answer whether the importance of the statement is very high or very low for a role that is largely administrative. Again, it's must concentrate on detail easily. To dig a bit deeper, while detail is what's being mentioned, the keywords in the statement are concentrate and easily. The focus is on working with detail for long periods of time and feeling content doing it. Heather, would you rank this statement, the concentrating on detail, as a very high importance, low, very low? What would you think? I would say very high. I would agree. I think probably in this type of role, 75%, I'm going to guess, of the time would be on it. What the disc factor here that's being looked for is high C. Okay, moving on to statement number two. Must be able to act without precedent. If the job entails a lot of first-time decision-making, then high importance should be selected. But if you know the candidate is going to be bound by procedures and rules, you're going to want to choose low for this one. What do you think, Heather? Okay, I think it's low. Okay, I would agree. I would rank that in this specific role as low. Yeah, in this role. Not a surprise, this one is teasing out the high D. Again, this kind of adds up to the what you want in your role. But again, depending on the business or the role, sometimes people would, would choose that high. And again, this is the advantage to being able to do this. You can kind of script your own behavioral profile to match what you're looking for. All right, number three is must have the skill to persuade others to their point of view. In other words, like, can you convince somebody of your perspective? If persuasion is a critical part of the job, you would answer this one as highly important. What do you think for this one, Heather? I think it depends on the administrative job, to be honest, but I would say typically it's low. Right. We're in agreement again. I would say low or even very low. This statement is looking for high eye, the influence factor. In this role, I don't see it as being super necessary. The next one is must have persistence to plug steadily at routine work. This question is measuring the ability to stick with repetitive routine work and see it through to the end. Now, as an FYI, this doesn't mean the work is low level. It's just consistent and ongoing. What do you think about this one? Uh, I think probably very high, depending on the job. Yeah. And I would say high. I mean, I think high to very high, but I agree. And of course, Uh, (laughs) this isn't a surprise. There was kind of a giveaway in the description with uh, the word steadily. So this is seeking high S steadiness. All right. Number five, must make unpopular decisions in carrying out the job. In this case, it's considering the ability to say no to people, but saying no based on the strength of their will, not because it's quote against the rules. Do you see the differentiation I'm making? somebody who can just say no because that's the strength of their conviction that's how they're feeling versus oh but the guidelines say such and such what would you think about this one heather like how important would this be uh, do you think in that kind of a role i would think that it's low yeah yeah i would agree this type of question is usually a job for a leader that's usually one of the unpleasant things that come with either being the ceo or you know a team leader is you kind of have to make the unpopular decisions so again this is focusing on high D. That's what this one was looking for. Is the where where is the D going to be? Is it going to be high? Is it going to be low? And answering it whichever way is part of what determines this. Number six is must seek authority in calculating risks. If you want the assistant to make judgment calls to take action on a regular basis, then you would select low. 
In most cases, though, the manager and the leader has the expectation that they are the ones making the decisions. In this case, I think I would select high for this because I would want the person to be checking in with somebody before taking a risk. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. All right, next. Must have the ability to motivate others. If the job requires managing high-influence people, for instance, sales reps, the ability to connect on an emotional level is more important than just operating on a task level. Really, that also plays into the profiles of the people that you would be dealing with. I think in this case, I wouldn't see this as being a super high ranking. What about you? Yeah, I wouldn't think so. And again, it depends. So if you're listening to this and it's a customized thing and maybe you want somebody who's also sort of like a client care coordinator and part of that is helping your team, helping to do that, maybe you would want the influence factor to be a little bit higher there. I've seen that too. This is the beauty of being able to customize your own description and profile. All right, number eight, must have the patience to follow detailed instructions. The focus on the statement is about the patience (laughs) required for being procedural, thorough, finishing. If this is a key element in the job, you would select highly important. Yes, Heather? Yeah, so this one must be highly important. Mm -hmm, Definitely. And this one, of course, is measuring for steadiness, the high S, where patience comes in. All right. uh, Number nine, must be able to handle interruptions and changes. I think this one's going to be very interesting. Uh, I have a struggle with this with a lot of my clients on this one. When interruptions and unexpected scenarios pull the person away from their main job function and require a quick response, then high or very high should be chosen. It's really hard, right? Because when you're in an administrative role, a lot of what you're doing really requires precision, focus, concentration. So being pulled away, being interrupted can be very challenging in that role. So I do think this is a struggle because I think this is one of the ones where people want you to do both. (laughs) They want you to be able to focus and do that job to perfection. And they're also like, oh, but, you know, you have to deal with this crisis or you have to deal with that. This is one of those forced choice situations I have to get you to choose. What do you think, Heather, for this role? How important is it going to be to be able to handle interruptions and changes? It kind of depends what administrative role it is. Yeah. Like if you're an EA for somebody, Mm. then you're likely going to have to handle this more than if you're at a front desk on a, a reception, maybe? I don't know. Yeah. I guess it depends on the role, like the specific job. Exactly. I think it could go either way here. You see why I said this one? <laughs> I See, this one is, I can tell you, this is one of the more challenging ones. This one really, really got to think about it. And it's tough because again, this is, we kind of want all of it, but if we have to choose, and again, you're absolutely right. You have the ability as the person creating this job profile To customize it, you know your business, you know the quirks, you know the ins and outs. So this allows you the ability to do that. Finally, the last one is, must be able to follow a system to perfection. If there are a standard set of operating procedures or guidelines that need to be adhered to, then this would be highly important in the role. I think it's pretty obvious that this one is looking for high C. (laughs) And how important do we think this one is in that role? I would say very important. Yeah, very important. Now that we've answered the questions, You can see how tempting it is to ask for every single attribute in a job description, right? See, we had that, Heather, didn't we? Even with that whole handling the interruptions, it's like, basically, that one was calling for high S, but being disrupted and handling things quickly is low S. You got to pick. I always forget about the low. (sighs) Heather, you want me to do an episode on the nuances of what the low factors mean, right? Yeah, because I think it's not to get in the weeds about it, but I do think it's something For me, anyway, as long as we've been doing this, I'm like, oh, it's not that they're a high this, it's that they're a low that. And our low ones bring strengths because your low S allows you to do a lot of things, right? It allows you to multitask. Okay, well, we're going to put a pin in that, listeners. I'm going to, I will follow up on that one at some point is really exploring what low means. I, I will always say low doesn't mean bad, but you're right. They don't get probably talked about enough for people to have a general understanding. All right. The value in this disk profiling tool is that it allows you to hone in on the essential skills required to be successful in the role. So yes, there's a whole array of them, but really for that specific role, what is essential? And that's what we've kind of mapped out a little bit there. Based on the way we answered these questions, the disk job profile that comes up is, drum roll. <laughs> Heather, do you want it? Is that your drum roll? <laughs> Uh, sorry, we'll have to put in a an actual drum roll there. <laughs> oh my gosh, 
gosh, Heather just shamed me for my drum roll. That was very weak drum roll. Oh, sorry. Heather, do you want to take a guess at what you think this disc job profile is going to come out as? Just in terms of the disc factors, what do you think it'll be? Yeah, absolutely. Because I can relate to it, I think the portion of it is like a high C. And then I'm making a guess on this one because I don't have any of this, but this is why I would hire an administrative role is because it's a portion of the work that I'm not great at would be like a high S. Okay. Well, look at you. Very good, Heather. What came out, so just so you know, listeners, I plugged this all into my system. I did the full version, the 24 questions so that I could get it done accurately. And what came out is high compliance, so high C, followed by high steadiness. So yes, it's looking for the C and the S. And then the influence is low and the dominance is the lowest. And here's the description that it reads for this one. The job profile suggests that the job incumbent will be required to operate in a technical, specialist, or quality area of an organization. The job requires someone who has an innate need to get things right and prefers to deal with tasks versus people. The person fulfilling this function should have the ability to work in a steady, thorough, and deliberate manner and have the persistence to see a job through to conclusion. Confrontation and unrealistic timescales should not be an important aspect of the job. Now that this job profile has been created, you can match up the DISC results for your candidates and you can see how close a fit they are to the ideal profile you're looking for. So I have a question. I actually have a couple of questions. Do your clients do DISC assessments for all of their candidates? That's a really good question. No, I don't recommend that they do. Uh, It's not time or cost effective, actually. So I don't recommend running them, you know, willy nilly. It's best to wait until you've narrowed it down to your serious contenders. Likely you'll have done at least one interview. You'll get a sense of knowing them, their qualifications, kind of what kind of impression you have. And then ideally you would do the disc before the second, or if you're someone that's doing a lot of interviews before the final interview, you'll be able to go into that interview knowing how closely the profile aligns with the job requirements. So that's going to facilitate a more candid and relevant conversation. And it's going to help you make a more informed decision, setting both you and the new higher up for long-term success. Do you ever help people create the job itself? Oh, that's interesting. Help them delineate what it is they need help with. And so I'll use myself as an example, if you don't mind, because I have a very small company. I tend to wear a lot of hats. I have unrealistic expectations of what people can do. And I'm self-aware enough to know that. And so I'm trying to create jobs that, because I can do multiple things, because I do that, I get to question whatever number it was. And I'm like, oh, yeah, but then you just need to do it super fast and on the fly. And if this happens today, we have to adapt. And while I have no problem doing that, I see now, especially after doing this episode, that that's unrealistic. And so is it possible for someone to say, okay, these are all the things I want a candidate to be able to do. And you say, help them go through and be like, it's not that they won't be able to do it, but it's going to be slightly more challenging or would need more training. Absolutely. Or like, is that the flip yeah, side? Yeah, so that's yeah. alignment to role. And in this case, too, often if I'm doing it, I'm working, I'm often working with teams or offices that already have had a lot of their employees profiled. The nice thing about that is if there's possibility for some kind of crossover overlap, I could actually say, hey, Heather in my system, and I know you have a need for this and this person that you really like for X, Y, Z reasons, they can't, maybe that won't be a natural fit. But you know, is there any way you can take this off Heather's plate, which she doesn't love and isn't strongly aligned to and maybe give her that part of the role. So we have actually done some reshifting of roles so that everyone is in alignment with their strengths. And you can imagine that just makes everyone better. Yeah, it makes so much sense. Yeah. So that's another advantage of of having the DISC job profiles in your system. And interestingly, so what happens every time I create uh, a new profile in the system, it automatically ranks every single person I have in my system. Let's say I plugged this one in, admin assistant. I have like hundreds come up and it's people from all kinds of different companies. But if you are a large company, 
the advantage of having that in your system is I can say, oh, you know what? Heather's really good for that role. Victoria's really good for that role. And then you can match it. So it's it's really, really strategic and it, it really helps. We're probably not good for the same roles. <laughs> I was using an example. <laughs> this is very true. We are not. But that's why we work well together. Exactly. Okay. On that note, listeners, if you're interested in creating job profiles for candidates and using DISC in the recruiting, hiring, onboarding process, connect with me at discoverwhatworks.org. Thanks for joining us. Catch you next time. Building highly effective teams. In this foundational session, you will learn strategies for building a new team as well as enhancing existing teams, how to hire tactically and onboard new members, intentional alignment, build a team, not a group, the diverse role factors needed for a high performing team. If you are interested in connecting with Victoria for team building, strategic onboarding, coaching, or speaking engagement, you can contact her at discoverwhatworks at gmail.com. This show is a Twisted Spur media production produced by our very own Heather McPherson. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share with a friend and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts.